warm welcome from mumbai technical society to all our chairpersons speakers and all the attendees uh, it's really heartening to see in last uh, couple of lecture series our attendance had been continuously been increasing uh, this is a virtual lecture series in general surgery and this is seventh in a row which we are, uh, have managed to keep uh, every friday so uh i'll ask dr niranjan agarwal the president of mumbai surgical society to take over the proceeding dr niranjan agarwal thank you rajesh uh, once again welcome all of you on this pleasant friday uh, evening uh, this is a seventh series and today the topics is quite uh, important is all regarding the venous diseases varicose vein venous ulcers and dvt and we have with us today all faculties including chairpersons who are uh, faculties of repute in this particular field you know they have made their own names in this field and they'll be deliberating on this subject so we are very happy and thankful that they have all obliged at as a very short notice and uh, without coming too much in your way between the faculties and you over to you uh, rajesh you can introduce the chairperson so that they can take the proceedings further thank you everyone uh thank you niranjan uh, we have two eminent chairpersons today uh, dr sanjay kulkarni and dr kanthi kumar rathod uh, dr kanthi kumar rathod is uh, additional professor uh, division of interventional radiology say gs medical college and km hospital mumbai he is a consultant and head of department of vascular and interventional radiology at bombay hospital Uh, we have worked for last uh, more than 10 15 years with dr uh, uh, kranti and uh, is a very uh, 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 renowned uh, interventional radiology with skillful hands uh, uh, another chair persons are dr sanjay kulkarni dr sanjay kulkarni is a consultant surgeon vishwaram bag hospital and he is a center for endo venous laser treatment at sangli maharashtra he has been working with surgical lasers since 1994 and his interest in varicose vein and endovenous management is since 2005 so over to dr sanjay kulkarni and dr kranti rathod to introduce the speaker and start the proceedings thank you thank you rajesh for the kind for the kind, kind introduction it is said that varicose venous disease is a penalty that mankind face for for standing against the gravity treatment of this disease is gives you the right result provided our approach to treatment is right to tell you more about this we have dr shekhar a consultant vascular and endovascular surgeon at kokila ben dirubai ambani hospital and without further delay i welcome dr dr shekhar uh for for his for his talk over to you dr shekhar good evening can you see my slides yeah you can okay so uh, without wasting much time uh, i'll get started with my presentation i'll be talking about varicose veins and uh, its diagnosis and management uh the plan of my presentation will be i'll talk a little bit about definitions the whole assembly of uh, the venous tree what the problem is who to treat uh, and how to evaluate a patient which i feel is the most important part of the varicose veins treatment what you would want when you uh, advise a duplex scan or a color doppler test and i'll briefly touch upon the options for treatment uh, without going too much into the technicalities because that would be another session probably so the definition what we call varicose veins actually uh, what we call varicose veins comes under an umbrella of a word called chronic venous insufficiency which is actually a condition when the venous wall or the valves in the veins are not working effectively making it difficult for blood to return to the heart from the legs so this chronic venous insufficiency cvi as we call it causes blood to pool and collect in these veins and this pooling phenomenon is called stasis which we so frequently hear in our uh, clinical technical uh, parlance what we call stasis 
so before i get into the depth of varicose veins it's important to know exactly what the assembly is so what are we dealing with a little bit into the basics just for a recapitulation uh, the assembly consists of the superficial veins the great saphenous and the short saphenous vein there is a deep vein going right through the middle of the leg there are two junctions which are spoken of frequently the saphenofemoral and the saphenocoplateal junction and there are perforators now in undergraduate level probably we just talk about the pocket void and dot but in reality actually there are 205 odd perforators in the leg uh, which i will come to very briefly uh, uh, when i talk about uh, perforators in the management of uh, varicose veins and then there is a very important component with, which is grossly underrated which one must one must realize and evaluate when you have to select your cases and that is the muscle pump uh this is the calf pump as you can see the pictogram shows that for the veins to actively pump blood upstream up into the abdomen you need a mobile ankle and you need a strong calf muscle now these two things are grossly underrated and not evaluated and that is the reason why a lot of frustrated uh, varicose veins operated patients we see you know going from pillar to post trying to find a solution i'll come to it a little bit more in detail when we talk about the case selection uh, this is a little bit of a pictogram that shows you what the normal venous return is like you see the integrity of the valves in the veins is of paramount importance and the red arrows on the right show you the importance of a, of the calf pump which actually tweaks so that blood is supposed to flow only in a unidirectional manner from below to upwards the same is the case with the perforators it is important to understand that blood in the leg goes from the superficial into the deep system and not the other way around as happens when the perforators leak so on the picture on the top you see blood actually gets uh, drained from the superficial into the deep system through the perforators and not the reverse way as you would see in a pathological condition a little bit about the anatomy one needs to know one one needs to understand the uh complications that one might encounter in varicose veins and the litigation that follows it there are two important nerves that one needs to uh take care of the great saphenous uh vein is very closely associated with the saphenous nerve uh which joins it very closely about a hand's breadth below the knee joint and the short saphenous uh vein is closely associated with uh the sural nerve and these two nerves might be a source of uh, uh, frustration for the patient if the things don't go well with your procedure so what is the problem exactly when we talk about varicose veins so basically the problem is that there is a reflux of blood from high pressure deep system to the low pressure superficial system via these leaky valves now what happens when this high pressure blood dil dilates these veins because of high pressure going into the low pressure these veins start swelling up so the superficial veins start swelling up and they they are what we call varicose veins so in the end we have a large pool of stagnant venous blood in the superficial system of the leg and if in this case what happens is what we call a valvular failure there a brunt of the high pressure deoxygenated blood and we know that venous blood is deoxygenated it is destined to go to the lungs to get oxygenated so when this deoxygenated blood lies idle in the leg and uh, the the brunt of that pressure is borne by the ankle there is capillary leak uh, there is inflammation around the ankle we get all the signs and symptoms of advancing varicose veins which is uh, from pigmentation to itching to eczema to ulceration all these so that is the end result so if 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 one wants to explain to your patient what happens if i don't get it done it's not a life threatening condition but the end thing is Uh, a venous ulcer so the goal of management of any varicose veins would be to prevent a venous ulcer and all the symptoms that go into uh, a, a, an ulcer formation so when you see a patient in your clinic for varicose veins what is the kind of information that you would want from a patient typically this is what we call a history taking in our uh, in clinical practice so most of these symptoms in varicose veins would be more towards the end of the day typically the patient in an uncomplicated uh, case of varicose veins with symptoms would say that the legs feel heavy legs feel swollen restlessness aching 
and nocturnal cramps. The next thing we do is once the patient comes with these findings is a clinical examination which should always be done in a standing uh, as well as a lying down but definitely in the standing position uh, so as to uh, expose the patient properly and look for all the involved system whether we need to evaluate whether it's from the great saphenous or the short saphenous system and if there are any kind of complications that we see in the leg when we expose it and I'll come to what complications we would look at. And this is a slide to tell you what the complications we should be looking for. As you can see, there are a couple of terms, the corona phlebectatica or the ankle flare, lipodermatosclerosis, which is the typical champagne bottle leg. Uh, instead of hyperpigmentation, you might get areas of pale, uh, uh, pale uh, atrophy, which is called atrophy blanche. There might be edema, there might be areas of bleeding hemorrhage, a lot of eczema, or it might be just a severe kind of a thrombophlebitis. And I'll show you pictures of each of these. So if you look at all these pictures, you can see starting from the first one on the top left, you can see that uh, this is a varicose veins or a, what you call a varicose ulcer, which is different from a venous ulcer, which Dr. Paresh Pai will explain to you later on. So this is a varicose veins, of a varicose ulcer from the great saphenous, from the short saphenous. On the right or top, you can see the ankle flare, which you can see typically the leash of veins around the ankle, the typical champagne bottle leg, and in the bottom center, you can see instead of hyperpigmentation, there is a period of, uh, there is an area of pallor and this is called atrophy blanche. or you might get a patient coming with severe pain and phlebitis as you can see in the last picture. Now, the next thing that we, we would do in, in this current uh, day and age is not tie tunicates or, you know, make the patient lie up and down and up and down. We have evaluated the leg clinically, we have the symptoms, we have the signs. And the next thing we would do is probably send the patient for a color Doppler or a duplex scan report. Now, this is something which, uh, you know, it, it, there is so much of variation uh, in the kind of reporting. So I will tell you what the ideal report would be like and what you would want to see in a report. You would want to see the things that I've shown in your slides, right from the status of the SFJ, the SPJ, its site, the diameter of the veins, whether there is any mid-thigh perforator leakage, the status of the perforators, the exact location, the diameter, how much of blood is refluxing, and the status, very importantly, of the deep veins, including any evidence of reflux on standing. Now, this is something which I'd like to emphasize more of, more and more, is that very often our Doppler reports are done in the lying down position, and it's all, it's very difficult to demonstrate a reflux of blood in the deep veins when the patient is lying down. Uh, this is a typical Doppler uh, report that you would like to have uh, in your clinic, a printout of this, which you can attach to your patient's file and you can request your radiologist or whoever is doing the uh, Doppler test to please fill in these. And as you can see in this, there, is a, there are various columns, including reflux in the various veins, the duration, the size of the vein and uh, presence or absence of deep venous reflux, any, any deep vein thrombosis. And if you get a report like this, this helps you a great deal in planning your surgery. This is a picture just showing you that the Doppler is important, importantly done not only in the lying position, but also in the standing position as you could, uh, you could visualize in this slide. So once you've done this and you have the report with you, you have to ask yourself certain questions and not jump to surgery. So what are those questions you need to ask yourself? One, are these symptoms really due to venous disease? Because more often than not, the veins are there, the pain is there, but the, the pain and the veins might be due to different reasons and you jump into looking at a Doppler report and get a procedure done and the patient comes back to you or goes elsewhere to your colleague in a totally frustrated uh, you know, frame of mind. So once you have the reports and you have seen the patient, the first thing you have to ask, are these symptoms venous or are they related to any rheumatological condition, any orthopedic condition? a lymphatic condition or even an arterial conditions. Secondly, you need to ask, are these varicose veins complicated or uncomplicated? Are they associated with any arterial disease? Now, this is something which is very commonly done. Time and again, we have found patients coming to our clinic, they've had their veins ablated and what actually they have is an arterial disease. So please palpate the pulse uh, every time you see a venous, though the veins may be obvious, it's very important that you also feel the pulse in these patients so as not to rule out a kind of an arterial disease which may be underlying 
and may worsen when you apply compression in the later stages of management. Also, one needs to know, does this patient give a history, past history of a DVT, a post-thrombotic leg, might not respond that well. It might be a secondary varicose veins, and those don't really respond very well to the standards. Standard treatment with it, we often give our patients. Also, is there a calf pump failure? Because if, if you do your venous ablation or venous surgery, and your calf muscle isn't working, the, the leg swelling and the aching is going to continue. The patient is going to be very, very frustrated. So in selection of cases, we need to see all these. You need to ask yourself all these questions before you give a go-ahead to yourself to plan for any kind of a therapy for this patient. This is a picture just to quickly tell you, go take you back to the basic clinical examination of how to differentiate between a venous and a lymphatic edema. The stemma sign, as you can see in this picture. This is a picture showing you a post-thrombotic leg. And as you can see the, in the post-thrombotic leg, very often the deep venous valves are damaged. And despite all your superficial venous surgeries, the leg swelling and aching continues and the patient proceeds to having an ulcer and is very, very frustrated and gives a bad uh, you know, a, a report card for the operating surgeon who's done the superficial venous surgery. So once you've done all this uh, briefly, you can put the recordings of your findings down on this uh, on a chart, the typical CEAP classification. I don't want to go to details, the clinical staging one to six, the etiology, the anatomical classification, more of an epidemiological issue rather than a clinical thing. Probably most of us would actually in a CEAP just go for the C and the rest of them would be probably just uh, from investigations and uh, our clinical uh, inputs. So then we come to the management part. Once we evaluated and we feel that we need to treat these, so which are the veins that we would treat? So we need to remember the three C's, complications, complaints, or cosmesis. I put it down in that order because that's how the preference of case selection should be. Almost all of us who are doing varicose vein surgery would put cosmesis as the last choice and try avoid doing these cases too often because uh, very often patients have huge expectations and you know we, we, we never seem to come up to those expectations when we do our procedures. So the three C's are complications, complaints, and cosmesis. So what are the options in management? One is reassurance and phlebotropic drugs. You could give compression and physiotherapy. It could be a sclerotherapy or minimal access procedures or an operative procedure, which I've not mentioned, but because honestly, I haven't done an open surgery in the last 10 years. Uh, so probably in today's day and age, these would be the options that are given to the patient. And in the minimal access procedures is the thermal and non-thermal non uh, procedures. It could be one or more of these procedures. In many of the cases, we combine a minimal access procedure with the sclerotherapy and a compression and phlebotropic drugs. Uh, a little about reassurance and basically we often get patients who have no symptoms, veins here and there, and they're more anxious rather than anything else. So these are the patients who probably just require a kind of a, a counseling that they are not any dreadful uh, things that's going to happen to their legs. A little bit about phlebotropic drugs, that is medical management of varicose veins. Uh, these typically would be given in symptomatic venous pain when you show the pain emanates from the vein, but your duplex scan or your color Doppler test is normal, then probably these drugs would have some role in elevating the, the aching kind of pain and the little bit of edema that is there in the legs. It can also be used as a supplement to definitive procedures like ablation and compression in cases of CVI. Uh, this is how they act. Uh, so it improves the venous tone. So you have typically a lot of Daflon written in uh, prescriptions. So they improve the capillary permeability and fragility. And uh, it also is said to improve the lymphatic drainage, which probably explains why a, you know, a patient comes with an aching pain and minimal edema. Some of these would have a role. There are also certain calf pump exercises that we would give in these early varicose veins. And these are shown in the picture to strengthen your calf muscles, as I said, it's the calf muscles that pump the blood up upstream up into our lungs. And so we need to advise our patients to strengthen their calf muscles and that could probably improve venous drainage. It's very simple and can be done even at a place of work or at, or at home. A little bit about compression. 
uh, compression i will talk about in the next slide also i'll show you pictures basically compression therapy relieves symptoms conceals the veins prevents deterioration of skins uh, lesions more importantly sometimes you will have cases where you are not sure whether the symptoms are due to venous symptoms or not your doppler says that there is a reflux the symptoms are a bit vague so in these patients if you give them a brief period of compression with stockings and they get relief of pain probably the symptoms are venous and they will benefit from uh, some kind of procedure for their varicose veins the problem with the compression is it's a western concept it's made for colder climate so the compliance is extremely poor they cost a lot and it's a recurring cost and it's extremely difficult to pull up and down for the elderly especially the frail patients uh, who we get in our clinics uh, the types of compression stockings that are available commercially are class 1 2 3 and 4 also typically what is advised in varicose veins is a class 2 that is 30 to 40 mm of mercury uh, those are the uh, stockings that we advise for varicose veins this is a typical picture showing you and these are called graduated stockings because the pressure which is written on on the on the stocking is 100% at the ankle and it gradually reduces so that blood is made to go only uridirectionally what goes up really can't come down because the pressure in the ankle is higher than the pressure in the calf which is higher than the pressure in the thigh so this is a little bit about graduated compression stockings now why surgery is not out and i'm not talking about surgery is uh, because of the certain things which i'm mentioning in this slide uh, the recurrence rates are pretty high the incidence of nerve injury uh, to the sural and saphenous is pretty high if you see you know from the point of view of uh, of the debility that it causes in many cases this nerve injury might be permanent there are reports of major vessel injury which is very rare in any kind of other procedure there are arterial injuries and you make a big cut and there are stitches so the problems of wound infection wound healing extended hospital stay and all those issues are there so surgery is fast losing out in the management of varicose veins a little bit about sclerotherapy sclerotherapy is usually injecting this sclerosants into the veins they are usually suitable for non stem veins uh, residual veins patients unwilling for surgery or unfit for surgery and as an adjunct to surgery after we have ablated the main trunk of the gsv or the ssv what is used is either a, a injection polydocanol 1% 50% dextrose or std what we call sodium tetradecyl sulfate in varying concentrations depending on the size of the vein this is how we do it what we do is uh, we inject a combination of Uh, of air and a sclerosant in what is called a foam uh, sclerotherapy using two syringes usually the combination of sclerosant and air is in the is in a ratio of 2 is to 5 and this technique is called the tessari technique is done under ultrasound guidance and it's quite a simple thing which can be done in an even an outpatient or a clinic as you can see in this but this is not without complications as you can see in this picture so if you're not right with your needle and you're not right with your anatomy and your concepts you might land up causing this kind of a complication so so those sclerotherapy is very effective in treating the smaller veins it is not without complications and one has to be well versed with this procedure before venturing into injecting chemicals into blood vessels uh, then we come to endovenous laser uh, endovenous ablation no endovenous ablation is a procedure that is less invasive than surgery and has a lower complication rate uh, in literature uh, how it works is by means of thermal destruction of the venous tissue uh, the thermal energy could be either from a laser fiber or a radio frequency generator and it is delivered to the desired location within the vein through a fiber that can be passed through a sheath which can be monitored through an ultrasound uh the advantage is that it can be done under local anesthesia or a regional anesthesia or a nerve block it's very attractive for the patient because it is conceptualized as a day care procedure it's marketed as a fire and forget technique that the patient walks up after the procedure and it has a much better cosmetic result uh especially if the patients are younger whom do we exclude in these procedures for thermal ablation pregnant women patients with arterial disease with an abi of less than 0.9 bedridden patients i won't really select 
patients for any kind of varicose vein treatment if they are bedridden, if they are unable to comply with uh, compression in the post procedure period and uncorrected or you know uncorrectable anti uh, anti coagulation or or coagulation disorders would be patients where we would exclude from these thermal procedures. Uh, a little bit of data, if one is interested in, is that the occlusion rates with these endovenous procedures is pretty good. It's 97% uh, at three years in one series by Cheter et al. Uh, the major complications in well-trained hands is less than 1%. And if you see the recurrence rates, uh, it's probably much lower than open surgery in hands that are trained. There are a couple of RCTs in open versus endovenous laser, and all of them are heavily tilted towards favoring endovenous lasers or endovenous thermal ablations over open surgery. Uh, so these are the two pictures showing you the RF on the left and the radio frequency on the left and the laser. Uh, both of them are thermal ablation. So the, obviously the next question would be, which is better, RFA or laser? Well, the answer is quite simple. There are many ways to skin a cat. Uh, whichever way you're comfortable with, the whole principle is the same. If you're comfortable and well-trained in laser, it's probably as good as radio frequency ablation, though I personally have switched from laser to radio frequency ablation. This is the post-operative result. There is some amount of echimosis that the patient has to be warned about, but these are all gone in about a month's time. Uh, really, there is no cutoff limit for the laser size we have seen. You know, even large veins like this have been uh, what we call lasered or thermally ablated. Uh, the only problem with thermal ablation is that there is a little bit of paraphernalia that goes with it. You need a thermal generator, you need a tumescent pump, which is basically tumescence for those who don't know what a tumescence is. You need to inject uh, a saline solution containing uh, local anesthetic as well as some sodium, uh, soda bicarb and cold saline around the vein before you ablate it so that there is no collateral damage and it acts as a heat sink and compresses the vein against the uh, fiber. So you need a kind of a pump to inject that. So it requires a paraphernalia and you need to be have a little bit of knowledge of using an ultrasound machine. So that is the uh, issue with uh, which might be a kind of a mental block for some general surgeons who wish to get into uh, thermal ablation for varicose veins. A little bit, just one slide to tell you about perforators. Now this is something which uh, very frequently we see in, our, in uh, among general surgeons that they send a patient for a, a, a perforator marking and the patient comes back with about 20, you know, Mehendi markings all across the leg. Now, do these perforators really need to be treated? Well, the answer is short and sweet. The only perforators you would treat is when they are incompetent, one, which means that their reflux is more than 500 milliseconds. And when they are pathological, meaning their size is, uh, is 3.5 millimeters or more, the varicose veins is C4B, C5, C6, and is in close proximity to an ulcer. So we treat, which are the perforators to treat? We only treat perforators which are incompetent and are pathological. And what are the pathological points? I have shown you in this slide. The rest of the perforators, there are hundreds of them. They are more treated as the effect rather than the cause. And the, th and the thinking is that if you treat the truncal reflux, these will all settle down in good time. And they don't really contribute to the symptoms a great deal. So, uh, as I said, stop doing open surgery for now close to 10 years because patients really are, you know, heavily tilted towards this. When we started off, thermal ablation, you know, is like any other technology, whether it's uh, laparoscopy or whether it's any kind of robotic, is always a protest against new technology. So we all of us who got into that, faced that initially uh, in our early days. Uh, this was a slide which, in fact, honestly speaking, I used to use in my early days of, uh, you know, delivering lectures from, this is a cartoon from uh, uh, Dr. Hemant Morparia, which said that this laser surgery, this whole hype about laser surgery is basically just a latest advance for surgeon to enhance revenue. So this was Unfortunately, a slide I used to use when I was not doing laser. But as time went by and more data started coming in, I mean, all, almost all of us who were into vascular practice switched to this kind of, you know, the, the advantage is so obvious. 
that now almost all of us and then of course there is a question that you know it's a great invention but what if it falls into wrong hands well that is always the case it does sometimes tool does uh, fall into wrong hands for the wrong reasons and so these procedures though they are fantastic they are not without complications as you can see in these pictures you can get all sort all sorts of horrific uh, you know complications from endovenous ablations if you are not uh, properly uh, you know in in sync with the technicalities and the knowledge of the anatomy and the case selection and the procedure itself uh to conclude before uh, i wind up what is the future of varicose veins therapy there are a lot of newer therapies that are come in uh, probably the most exciting of them are these two uh, what are called non thermal ablation that seems to be the future on the left you can see a glue which is uh, the trade name of which is venous seal it's a it's touted as an office procedure done under local anesthesia doesn't require tumescence all you need is basically a sterile table uh, and uh, you need an ultrasound machine so you just put this under local anesthesia put this tube into the vein see it on ultrasound and inject this glue and it seals off the entire vein you pull the catheter out and uh, you know patient goes home in 30 minutes flat that is the most exciting new kind of a technology that has come into the market it's still not that old so we don't know what the long term results are but if they are good probably it's it's something which is very attractive for the patient and the other is of course what you call me mechanical mechanico chemical ablation where you put in a catheter and you know you can actually give a combination of a, of a, of a chemical sclerotherapy and an agitating catheter which damages the uh, veins and makes it go into spasm and damages the endothelium and this again is again touted as an office procedure if a patient can come get it done and go home doesn't require any kind of tumescence as well and uh, touted as an outpatient procedure so to conclude uh you know varicose veins is there in abundance i would not say that it's a very difficult procedure to do i think the main challenge and all the skepticism about varicose veins is because of poor selection of cases so the uh, i think any teaching program where varicose veins is taught or is discussed i i always am heavily tilted towards trying to explain uh, how to select cases and what cases to do and more importantly what cases not to do what to expect and unless you know what to expect you can't explain to your patient what to expect so the 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 gist of it all is that plenty of cases learn the procedure but select well thank you thank you dr shekhar do you have any questions from part attendees any questions from attendees please uh, kanti there is one question Shashan. management of other complications yeah. like post thrombotic limb you can see in the chat box yeah, so think, one I, announcement I, one I announcement think, we want to make for the delegates today and that is that any uh, two person who raised their hand in the beginning uh, during the talk will be allowed to talk and ask their questions directly the rest have to put their uh, questions into the chat box so right now since nobody has raised hand you can take the questions from the chat box madam has raised hand okay uh, madam want to uh, i appreciate your talk dr shekhar uh, mm. as you mentioned that we are not very keen on performing surgical procedure nowadays and i think just to add to that one of the main reasons that i think is recurrence after surgery is extremely difficult to treat i think you will agree with me yes yes while recurrence after endovenous procedure is not so difficult to treat absolutely because the location of the vein remains the same yeah. while it's completely wonky after <laughs> surgical procedure yeah. i think imaging imaging plays a key role here like because it is everything is under vision like uh, surgical yes it is but uh, you are well guided by the, the by the imaging which actually that is how the endovenous laser ablation definitely laser or rf ablation scores over the the quality of ultrasound doppler reporting is also very important you know? oh yeah 
Yes, that's but one very sore point. <laughs> yeah, with us. So very often we get Doppler reports which are hardly four lines, you know, and and it gives you really no information. So there are centers where the doctors, you know, if you do your own imaging yourself, that is one thing. But in a busy center, that might not be practical. Yeah. Uh, but a good Doppler report has to be, you know, the basis of your the whole thing stands on the basis of your good Doppler report. You select which cases to do and how to do it and what not to do. So I think uh, you know there has to be a kind of a standard of reporting, the standard format for uh, reporting for uh, superficial venous disease, and uh, that is something which is lacking in in Mumbai, you know, and most cities. You yeah. Know, there's no stand, proper standard of reporting, which is why you know we have these uh, what you call. I mean, the, I think besides reporting, it is performance of Doppler also because majority yeah. of the Dopplers are done in lying down position. While yeah. I'm sure that we will all prefer a standing Doppler and lying down one as well. Yeah, and the Doppler is so operator dependent, and as yeah. they say, you know, if, if the mind doesn't know, the eyes will not see. Exactly. The operator also has to know a little bit of pathology and uh, pathophysiology of the vein in order to give a good report. One solution to this uh, problem is that get involved a radiologist while you are doing this procedure in the theater, theater rather than getting it marked from the radiology department and uh, doing the case in your clinic. So what I'm practicing last many years is uh, uh, the radiologist is always present while we are doing the procedure. So they know what is there and uh, how it is done. So we get better reporting. Also, one, uh, one more question, Dr. Shekhar. How do you avoid a nerve injury? Are there any tricks to avoid nerve injury? Because sometimes we have to treat veins below knee. So is there any way of uh, avoiding nerve injuries? Well, the, the two good old teachings for the GSV and the SSV are that, uh, you know, the, as far as the GSV goes, the, the saphenous nerve joins the, uh, is in very close proximity to the GSV just below the knee. So if you're going to do a traditional stripping of the vein, it's always advisable not to strip beyond one hand's bed, beyond the Boyd's perforator. But if there are, uh, you know, if, if there is a pathological segment of GSV, below the knee, then rather than stripping it or ablating it, what we do now is either we give a good sclerotherapy or if you have access to glue, you seal off the infragenicular part of the GSV with glue because uh, the, the nerve is, a, I, I can give you a typical example. If you see your patients who have had a CABG and have had a vein harvested from the leg, many of them have more symptoms in the leg from the leg pain rather than from the CABG sternal incision, you know, because, yeah. because the way the vein is harvested from that segment, very often they land up with a partial aversion of the, of the nerve. And once you get a partial injury, it's very difficult to, you know, settle that patient. So it's better in the GSV segment, if you are treating, it's better to not use any kind of thermal or mechanically aggressive method, uh, maybe just below the knee, rather stick to sclerotherapy or some kind of glue. Right, rather than any thermal or mechanical in, in the short saphenous. I would, uh, yeah, I would intervene uh, if we can move to the next lecture. It's nine forty, and any uh, Dr. Shaker, a request if there are any questions into the chat box related to your talk, please answer them to the uh, in the chat box itself so that the delegates uh, are accessible to your answers. Sure, sure, sure. Thanks. So, so, so if the chairman can take the next uh, talk. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. I have a pleasure in introducing Dr. Paresh Pai. He is a leading vascular and endovenous surgeon. Uh, he is practicing in Bombay Hospital, Hinduja Hospital, Bhavati, Andy, Bhatia Hospital, and many more. He has his own clinic in Gaudevi. He has particular interest in treating patients with chronic non healing ulcers due to vascular disease, ischemic diabetic foot, varicose veins, and deep vein thrombosis. Today he is going to talk about venous ulcer evaluation and management. Over to you, Dr. Paresh. Thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. It's indeed a pleasure to be here with all of you on a Friday evening. And I'm really pleased to see the number of people who are attending. Today's talk is going to focus on venous ulcers and venous insufficiency. Huh? Huh? So leg ulcers are a major cause of morbidity 
and compromise the quality of life. It's a leading cause of leg ulcers, is venous insufficiency seen in 50 to 60 percent of cases. The prevalence is less than 1 percent under 65 years of age and 4 percent after 65 years of age. It may be associated with arterial insufficiency in 5 to 10 percent of cases. The major hurdles we face while treating these patients is that they tend to recur. There are too many cooks who end up uh, getting involved in the treatment and sometimes there can be uh, problems. And the expectations from both patients and referring physicians sometimes can be difficult to meet. Oh my, this is not plain. Ah. Can you give me a minute, please? My images are not coming up. Okay, so a presentation today will look at pathophysiology of venous ulcers, how to get the ulcers to heal and stay healed, the importance and how to differentiate between primary and secondary ulcers, and definitive treatment I'll just touch upon. So pathophysiology of venous ulcers involves venous stasis and hypoxia, which is Homan's uh, hypothesis, AV fistula by Blalock, Hemovici and Pratt, lymphatic obstruction Bollinger, microangiopathy Bollinger, fibrin cuff therapy of Norman Browse and Bonin, and leukocyte trapping and activation by Coleridge Smith. So when you are treating this, do you treat the ulcer first? Does correction of reflux help heal ulcers? Now this is a very tricky one where you have people who say that yes, you should go ahead and do the surgery first because if you treat the ulcer first, then there's a possibility that the patient may not come back for treatment of the uh, ulcer for the definitive treatment. So that's the advantage of treating the reflux first. I don't really agree. I feel that treating the ulcer first is more important because invariably what happens is there are perforators which are located very close to the ulcer itself and most often than not they are missed because nobody likes to get the ultrasound machine close to the area of the ulcer as a result of which the treatment is incomplete you do the procedure and you find that the ulcer still doesn't heal so what are the steps when you are dealing with venous ulcers or varicose ulcers the first step is to rule out arterial insufficiency you must look at the arterial uh, look for the arterial pulsations and check if necessary by doing an MR angio or a CT angio to look and confirm that there is no arterial insufficiency. The reason is the treatment of the arterial system is exactly opposite to that of the venous system. In one, you raise the limb. In the other, you put the limb down. In one, you apply something tight around the leg. And the other, you don't do that at all. So that's very important. The second important thing is to estimate the quanti quantity of discharge. Many a times there's a lot of discharge that comes out and if you don't attend to that, what happens is that the dressings that you do, there's copious amount of fluid coming out. It ends up macerating the surrounding area and creating more problems. And you have to also check whether they are able to come to you weekly for getting the uh, dressings done. So when we look at treatment of venous ulcers, you heal the ulcer first. If required, start with antibiotics. If required, you find that there is swelling not only in the affected leg, but in the opposite leg. Check out what the JVP is like because a lot of these patients are elderly. They are hypertensive. They have uh, cardiac uh, diastolic dysfunction, fluid retention. And as a result of that, if you don't correct it, invariably they have high venous pressure. Like uh, Dr. Shaker mentioned, we use venous tonics, microflavonoids like Daflon. And we use compression bandage where you do the appropriate dressing, apply a moisturizer for the surrounding skin, then use either a Gamgee roll or you use multi-layered bandages, which is like a uh, system. Uh, Niranjan, I just need two minutes because none of my images are coming up on this. Uh, can you give me a minute, please? Yeah, or if you feel we can take the next talk first or you'll be able to sort out in a minute. Uh, just give me a minute and let me see if I can okay. uh, what, what the issue is. It was, sure, I sure, checked sure. before, 
it seemed to be doing well but i don't know what what's the problem now no no do it yeah you can get the next talk done uh, this it will take me about a few minutes to get it done you can start with madam and i'll i'll resume where i have uh, stopped fine sanjay you can introduce madam and okay. madam are you ready yeah. yes ma'am are you ready yeah madam okay yeah. okay uh, dr madhuri gore who was a professor and head of department of department of surgery ltm medical college and sian hospital she is a consultant general surgeon and phlebologist at jain hospital uh, she was the first post director for post uh, doctoral fellowship in trauma care she has many publications and multiple research projects under her name over to you gore madam Uh, sorry parish for yeah, no problem uh, my topic for today's talk is deep vein thrombosis and uh, this ideally should be probably the last talk because the previous two talks are dealing with occasionally the complications of deep vein thrombosis uh way back almost uh, 160 years ago Furcor described this triad of stasis, hypercoagulable state, and endothelial damage, which can lead to development of a thrombus in the deep veins without direct venous injury. And there are multiple conditions in each of these factors that can lead to development of deep vein thrombosis. Usually, we see that there are at least two factors that come together. that lead to dvt out of all these factors uh the clinical picture of dvt why i have mentioned here leg edema is mainly because dvt occurs most often in the lower extremities though it can also occur in upper extremities and in very specific conditions it can occur at rare locations such as cranial venous sinuses it can occur in mesenteric veins portal vein and this happens in association with hereditary thrombophilic state and at present with covid so we should all be aware of these conditions when we see dvt in unusual positions coming back to the leg dvt invariably it is unilateral leg edema and the extent of edema depends on the state of patient whether the patient is recumbent or patient is ambulatory if patient is ambulatory the edema can be significant while in the recumbent patient there may not be any edema even though the patient has significant dvt the size of the clot is another factor if the clot is occluding the lumen completely the edema is extensive while it is not so much if the clot is not occluding the lumen completely and so is the location more proximal the clot more is the edema so the leg is tense tender there may be erythema full visible superficial veins is a very typical sign of complete occlusion of the vein human sign may be positive Homan himself has said that it is positive only in about forty percent of patients, but we still continue to teach that to the students. Uh, there are multiple other conditions which may confuse one when it, one is coming to diagnosis of deep vein thrombosis, and I have enlisted these conditions in this particular uh, slide. Uh, probably the most common cause that may be confused with dvt is ruptured baker cyst but of course depending on the investigations that you perform you can decide the diagnosis and confirm your suspicion of dvt to decide the probability of 
a particular patient having dvt wales decided to have some point system so these are the wales criteria which are based on the history and on the findings on clinical examination and different points have been given to these different items uh, it helps us in deciding what type of investigation we should proceed with and whether it is likely to be dvt or not likely to be dvt if the score comes less than 0 then there is a low risk of this being dvt but anything more than that more than 1 there is moderate or high risk of this being dvt so the choice of investigation will depend on this and i will come to that later in year 2000 wales came out with modified wales criteria and these are little simplified and fewer uh, criteria that he has pointed and we can uh, roughly get an idea whether this particular patient is likely to have develop pulmonary embolism or not likely to have pulmonary embolism and how does this help us we can now treat patients at home particularly with low molecular weight heparins but patients who are likely to develop pe should not be treated at home with low molecular weight heparins they need to be hospitalized and that's the importance of this coming to investigations when there is a low possibility or low probability of this being dvt d dimer is the investigation that can be performed as most of us know d dimer is a by product of fibrinolysis and it has got 96% sensitivity but it doesn't have great specificity it does have good negative predictive value so if you do d dimer and it comes normal you can rule out existence of dvt but having d dimer positive doesn't give you exact diagnosis of dvt and then with high suspicion of dvt our next investigation is duplex ultrasound or better called as compression ultrasound this is the gold standard today particularly for femoral and popliteal vein thrombosis um i think part of the photographs is covered but it's okay compression ultrasound means that under to understand that a normal vein can be compressed when we give pressure with the probe of ultrasound and you can see here that this vein is compressed this is an artery uh, the other photograph is covered but when the vein is full with clot you cannot compress the vein with the pressure of the pressure of the probe and so non compressibility is one of the findings associated with dvt other two findings that are associated with dvt on ultrasound are either no flow in the vein or loss of phasicity of venous flow and of course the clot or the thrombus that you would visualize in the vein lumen if two of these findings are there one should not be performing distal compression 